Most of you probably know uh, about me that I'm not a very big music person. I mean, I married one, but I could care less about music. And I think church, instead of singing together, when you walk in the door, we all get a book and we sit and read for a half hour. And then we have a sermon. That's just me. I'm different and I'm strange and I know you all love music. And so I thought that maybe this Christmas it would be kind of neat if, if I would take out a hymnal in the mornings and read some of our Christmas songs as though it were some sort of book. And, and I have had the most wonderful time as part of my devotions reading these Christmas songs that I'm so used to singing. I mean, the songs we sang this morning, I, I didn't even have to look at the words. I know them, but I never think about them when I'm singing them. I'm just singing the song because that's what we do. My song this week that I, I read on Monday, it starts out like this. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And I guess because this week we lit the candle of peace, this really kind of stuck with me. So I looked into, to, I heard the bells on Christmas Day a little deeper and and the the song is written by Henry Longfellow and what's interesting to note is that when Henry penned these words the United States was in the uh, the heat of the moment of the American Civil War in the words of the song Henry seems to stop and look around at what he's witnessing. He has a moment of clarity that seems to be fueled by the ugly, obvious reality of his experience of war. War is raging around him, and he writes the middle verse of this song. And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. There is no peace on earth, I said. As I read those words, or maybe from now on as I sing those words, I kind of have to lower my head a little bit and nod in agreement. I understand what Henry Longfellow was experiencing at this particular point of his hymn. From from junior high ball games to global politics to wars and rumors of wars, our continent, our planet is consumed with discord and conflict and what seems to be an inability for the human race to get along. Henry's heartache and despair, I can feel that. And I know some of you do as well. If we've paused long enough to look at the world around us, there's on many days very little to give us cause to think peace is going to happen. And yet those angels declared on that Christmas night so long ago, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to all men. I guess after a little more prayer, uh, a little quiet time, I don't know. But Henry finds it in his heart to declare the angels were correct in their pronouncement. His song continued. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does He sleep. The wrong shall fall, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Though it may not seem like it in the moment, the Christ child for certain is the Prince of Peace. 
His peace is so much more than just being kind to one another. It's so much more than doing goodwill or acts of goodwill to one another. The Christ child brings us a peace, but He brings us peace with a purpose. And I want to talk about the purposes of peace this morning. I think number one, the first thing, Jesus came to bring us peace with God. From Colossians chapter 1, we hear the words of Paul, for in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile Himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. From Ephesians 2, Paul continues this thought, Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself has made us peace. So now, you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets of Christ Jesus Himself, of which is the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by His Spirit. Jesus came to bring us peace with God. We, because of our sin, were separated from God and we could not reach God. So God reached out to us in Christ. He came to bridge the gap that kept us cut off from God. He came to take away our sin in order that we might be able to come into the very presence of God. And as I I, I thought about it this week, not only are we invited into the presence of God, and He doesn't just welcome us as visitors. The Scripture says that that He makes us His sons and daughters. And we get to come and, and sit in His presence as His children. Not people who who come and have anything to prove. Not people who come and have anything they have to do or not do in order to earn a spot there. Just like our kids. He just welcomes us in to His presence. Second part of this peace that Jesus comes to bring, He came to bring us peace within ourselves. I've shared it before. Uh, I am my own worst critic. I am harder on me than anybody else on this planet can be. I hate when I screw up. I hate when I don't meet my expectations. I hate it when I disappoint other people. I hate it when I don't meet their expectations. And I beat myself up for that like nobody. What I'm quick to forgive in everybody else, I do not, I will not let my own self off the hook. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is from Romans chapter 7. And maybe this describes you. Paul says, I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. And he goes on and he has this argument with himself. What I want to do, I can't do. What I don't want to do, I can't stop doing. And he just beats himself up over it. And I can put myself in Paul's shoes, and I feel exactly like that a lot of the days of my life. But Paul, see, I I kind of get hung up there. I get hung up in the beat myself up part of the, the, the deal. Paul doesn't stop there. From Romans chapter 8, verse 1, his very next thought says, For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Paul acknowledges that he can't get it right. Paul acknowledges that he's constantly going to mess up. And and that's just the reality of being a person. But because of what Jesus has done, there is not condemnation to be heaped upon us. Jesus came to bring us peace even amongst ourselves. We don't have to beat ourselves up. Thirdly, He came to bring us peace with one another. 
It doesn't come natural. I mean, sometimes it's easy when it's with the people that you really like. But for the most part, getting along with everybody else is difficult to do at times. It goes against the desires of our flesh. And I guess that's why so much of the New Testament material following the death and resurrection of Jesus deals with us as followers of Christ learning how to get along with others. And, and, and not just with one another in the church, but learning how to get along with those in the world, even if they disagree with us and we with them, even if our worldviews are totally opposite, because of what Jesus has done in us, we can be at peace with people and still not agree with them. And what we see happening in the New Testament is that's how the church exploded. It's they, they didn't treat the world like everybody else. They treated the world like Christ did. Another hymn that I read this week, and I think we sang it on the first night of, or the first morning of Advent, O Holy Night. And, and it's long, and I thought, man, I wish I could sing, because I'd love to sing this one in front of everybody. But you get to the very last stanza. And the hymnist writes, Truly He taught us to love one another. His law is love and His gospel is peace. Chains will He break for the slave is our brother and in His name all oppression will cease. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise His holy name. Christ is the Lord, O praise His name forever. Jesus came to put us at peace with one another. John chapter 17, verse 11, as Jesus is, is about to come to the end of His earthly days, as He's praying, He says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, Father, and I am coming to You. Holy Father, keep them in Your name which You have given Me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus is praying that we would be united, but that we would live in peace together. He doesn't pray that we're strong or bold or clever or funny or good-looking or wealthy or any of the things that we use to define ourselves by. He prays that we might be at peace with one another. Hebrews chapter 12, we're told to strive, with, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness that without which no one will see the Lord. Or Romans 12, verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Granted, there are some people that are not going to like what we believe. They're not going to like our worldview, and because of which we might be insulted or we might be persecuted. Who knows, we might even be killed for what we believe. But as it depends on on us, live peaceably with all. I still have a long way to go when it comes to that part. I get along great with you all. You all are kind and nice. And... But when people attack me, my first response is to fight back. When people insult me, my first response is to insult back. What about Jesus when they took Him away? He, he didn't hurl insults. He didn't fight back. He told His disciples to put away their swords because when you fight like that, you die like that. Live at peace with one another. If the God of heaven can give His Son to a people who He knew would, would ultimately torture Him and kill Him, shouldn't there be something on our end of this deal that says we can live beyond ourselves? because of what that child has done in us. And then finally, this fourth part of peace. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, in Jesus' most undoubtedly His greatest sermon of all times, His Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called... That means you fill in the blank. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called... Is that blah, 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 blah? I mean, I know my eyes are shot and my ears are following quick, but they're not that bad. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. That takes us all the way back to the start where we find out that it's His blood of Him who is our peace that makes us sons and daughters of God. And if we're sons and daughters of God, then it stands to reason we have to be people who are peacemakers. I know there are people in the world who thrive on making conflicts, who love drama that they can stir up and, and dish out to the world around them. And Jesus says that you are sons and daughters of God if you reject that sort of lifestyle. Instead, and it's not just enough to, to not stir up discord and, and disharmony and whatever the opposite of peace is, chaos maybe. It's not just enough to not do that. But you have to be people who are willing to work for peace in all circumstances, in all situations, with all people. I guess two out of four is not bad. We're growing, right? But that's the kind of life that we are expected to live. We love the, the fire insurance and the pie in the sky, but, but some of these things that go with it, we're not so accustomed to, to, to living out in, in day in, day out, get up, go to work, go to school sort of life. If we're going... If we're going to enjoy the privilege of being called sons and daughters of God, then we have to live like it. We've got to live like it. And Jesus says, to live like it, you have to be someone who makes peace. From Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. They're familiar words, but hear them again this morning in the context of peace. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and of His peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over His kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Not only was Jesus' purpose to bring us peace, peace is His identity. It's the very nature of the Son of God. And I would suggest today that, that any attempt to live outside of the realm of peace, whether it's with God, with ourselves, with our other people in life, any attempt to live outside the realm of peace is an attempt to live without Christ in the world. So today I just simply ask these questions as we close. Are you at peace with God? Scripture's told us there's only one way to be at peace with God, and that's through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you at peace with yourself? Maybe you're beating yourself up for something stupid you did 30 years ago, 20 years ago, yesterday. I mean, the, the Spirit of God works in such a way that God doesn't hold us accountable to that. God has forgiven and moved on, and maybe it's time we should allow ourselves to be forgiven and to move on. Are you living and working for peace with those around you? I don't like it either, but, but that's what we're called to. That's what our identity is. If, if the Son of God is alive in us, His identity becomes our identity, and we have to be working for peace. Christmas is the time to know God's peace. 
It's the time most especially to make it known. My prayer for you this Christmas, my prayer for us as a church, is that we would be saturated with the very peace of God which passes all understanding. That God would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ with the peace that He gives. May we pray this morning. Father, today we come. Sometimes peace couldn't be any farther from our reality. Maybe we're caught up in the middle of something else, or maybe we're we're the creator of discord and chaos. Maybe it's just what goes on inside of our our bodies, our lives, our spirits, God, where we just have this constant battle taking place. Maybe. Maybe it's because we haven't fully welcomed the peace of Christ. God, permeate us and saturate us with that peace that we see in that lowly, lowly manger. Saturate us with that peace that, 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 that shattered the darkness of our world. With the advent of Your Christ. God, grant to us peace this morning, not as the world gives, but as You give. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.